Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I have to say that what I'm going to be talking about is, is mainly the contemporary global economic crisis. And uh, it makes me um, talking about this subject at, at this Marxism makes me acutely aware of the absence of Chris Harmon because it, Chris, more than anyone else, developed our understanding both of the dynamics of capitalist crisis and of the particular nature of the present, present crisis. So I do feel the kind of burden of his absence particularly strongly here, here today. Chris, of course, would be very impatient with that kind of stuff and just say, get on with it. So I will get on with it. Um, I, want to, I want to start the substance of what I say by uh, quoting, I quoted him yesterday, but it's still um, an Im important statement, quoting the American Keynesian economist, um, a leading figure on the uh, left wing of the, well, center of the Democratic Party in the United States, Paul Krugman, who wrote in the New York Times about a week ago, that he thought we were in the early stages of what, we, what he called the, the Third Depression. Uh, and in other words, what he was doing was comparing the present economic crisis to two earlier very severe crises in the history of capitalism. The, um, the, uh, what's, what's, what he calls the Long Depression, the long period of economic stagnation and slow growth that capitalism experienced between roughly the middle of the 1870s and the middle of the uh, 1890s, and then, of course, the Great Depression of the 1930s, the worst economic crisis in the history of, of capitalism. And I think that the, the placing the present economic crisis in that way historically is, is very useful, because what it helps us to understand is that the, um, the crisis that broke out, that became visible uh, when the uh, international banking system froze in the summer of 2007, that's to say nearly um, three years ago, wasn't just uh, a concentrated catastrophic event, a huge, as uh, mainstream economists like to call it, shock to the capitalist economic system. You know, a shock is something... I think necessarily that's quite brief and that then the system can shake off and carry on with its no in, its, in its normal way. What we're, what we're uh, in is a, a protracted economic crisis. We have to see this crisis not just in a historical context, but itself, as itself a historical phenomenon. In other words, something that has a relatively protracted um, duration in, in time, and that goes through a number of different, different, different stages. Um, what my book Bonfire of Illusions is, is really about is trying to situate the, the, this crisis historically, um, and I, I try to do that, maybe it's a bit fanciful, but I tr try to do that with reference to two events that took place in the late uh, summer and early autumn of 2008. First of all, the war between Russia and, and Georgia in August 2008, and secondly, uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, one of the biggest investment banks in the United States. Uh, one of the the the, the, mo the moment that at which the economic crisis morphed into a global, a global economic catastrophe which took place on the 15th of September 2008. Why did I talk about those two, two events? Not, I mean, Lehman Brothers, in a way, has kind of passed into um, almost the folklore of the crisis as a, as a decisive event. I talked also about the war between Russia and Georgia because what I argue in the book is that we have to see the late summer and autumn of 2008 as the historical moment when the post-Cold War era comes to an end. The post-Cold War era, starting at the end of the 1980s, which sees the global triumph of liberal capitalism against its, uh, its rival in the state capitalist 
Stalinist countries, above all the so Soviet Union. And that involves um, economically neoliberalism, a set of hard uh, free market policies becoming the orthodoxy that was institutionalized and enforced on a, on a global scale. But that the, the entrenchment of neoliberalism as a set of economic policies, or as I like to call it, an economic policy regime, something that is institutionalized and shapes the, the adoption of policies, is accompanied by the, the US emerging as the unchallenged d dominant global, global power. And if we want to understand the geopolitics, in other words, the politics of rivalries between different states of the subsequent two decades, uh, it's really about the United States successive administrations using a number of different methods in order to entrench and perpetuate that global domination. Policies like the expansion of the European Union and of NATO into Eastern and Central Europe uh, uh, are uh, part of that uh, process of attempted entrenchment. So, of course, is the, the war in I Iraq, the invasion and occupation of I Iraq. And what I argue is that the late summer and early, uh, the early autumn of 2008 is the moment at which it becomes clear that that period is over. Economic neoliberalism as an ideology is trashed by the the, the uh, financial crash and what that leads to, which is, the, uh, which is a global economic slump, the worst since the, since the sec second, second World War. But also the, it becomes very clear that the attempt to entrench and perpetuate US hegemony has also failed. I mean, it failed fundamentally because of the failure of I the invasion of Iraq to lead to the... Um, both the, the um, underpinning of US domination of the Middle East, but also the, to the spread of pro-Western, uh, at least superficially liberal democratic regimes in the, in, the, in the Middle East. But that's underlined and reinforced when the Russians essentially wage a war on Georgia. There's argument about who started it, but that's really a secondary thing. They wage war on Georgia essentially as a way of saying we're going to smash militarily one of the most pro-Western regimes on our borders in order to demonstrate that the expansion of NATO has to stop. We are not going to allow NATO to encircle us uh, to, to our very, very borders. And the Russians are completely successful in this. The issue of Georgia and Ukraine becoming members of NATO has just gone off the geopolitical agenda. Ukraine now has a president who is pro-Russian and who signed a deal that allows the Russian Baltic fleet, sorry, not Baltic, wrong, <laughs> wrong sea altogether, the Russian Black Sea f fleet to continue to be based in the Crimea, which is part of the, the, the Ukraine. So that war rendered visible the, 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 the if you like, the containment of US hegemony and uh, underlined that the attempt to entrench U.S. hegemony had failed and that the U.S. was having to confront its, the decline in its relative power compared to other leading capitalist states. And, of course, the economic crisis itself further um, underlines that because, of, because it was a crisis that started in the United States itself that is widely held to be a consequence of the kind of deregulated free market capitalism that prevails in the United States and so on. But it's also um, talking about the, the Georgian war was a way of underlining that the crisis um, is a, isn't simply an economic event, it's also a political of, event with all sorts of implications for the relations between states and also all sorts of ideological Im implications. The, when the title of my book talks about bonfire of illusions. The main illusions that I'm talking about are represented by the neoliberal ideology itself, thrown into question massively by the, the crisis. What I want to do now, however, is to focus on the economic dimension of the, of the crisis because this, as I said, this is a historically evolving phenomenon and it's very important to, to understand. 
that. Um, of course, it was a crisis that started in the financial system, or more precisely, it started in the American housing finance system, the famous subprime mortgages that were sold uh, on an industrial scale to people who were too poor to actually um, sustain and repay or even keep up the interest repayments on the loans that were being made to them. And when it became clearer that larger and larger numbers of people who'd received these subprime mortgages weren't able to repay the loans, that was the moment at which the whole um, American, no, American and European financial system started to un unravel. But the financial crisis has much uh, deeper roots. And I want to talk first of all about the, 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 the background in the financial system to the, that unravelling and then to talk about the even deeper roots. Um, there's a lot of talk about financial imbalances. There's a lot of talk about how the global economy uh, suffers from the fact that in certain ways the financial system is deeply unbalanced. And that's right, although it doesn't get to the core of the, the problem. But let me mention two imbalances in, in particular. First of all, and this is something that's become even more visible as a result of the economic cr crisis, there's a division between creditor and debtor states. In other words, there's a division between states that uh, are very successful at exporting, that run big um, uh, surpluses on their balance of payments, and that use those surpluses to lend money to, to other states. And the most important creditor states in the world, although there are a number of others, are G China and, and Germany. Uh, these are both incredibly successful exporting economies, the two biggest exporting economies in the world, great hubs of manu manufacturing pr production. As a result, they run, a, run big balance of pay payment surpluses, and they use those surpluses to lend money to, guess who? The debtor states. That's the other side of the division. Who are the debtor states? Well, interestingly enough, the most... And famously now, the biggest debtor state in the world is the United States. And the United States uh, secures massive financial inflows, not just from China and the rest of East Asia, but actually also from Germany, from Japan, from the oil exporting states uh, in, the, in the world as, as well, that um, have allowed the, the US to cover its massive balance of payments deficit. In other balance of payments deficit means that the US imports far more than it exports. How does it pay for the imports that it, it doesn't cover through exporting? Essentially through borrowing money from the, the rest of the world. And there's a very interesting study by an American political economist called Herman Schwartz who, are, who shows that because the US is the center of the global financial system and in particular issues the world's main reserve currency, it's able to organize those financial flows in a way, in such a way that the countries that lend money to the United States get a much lower return on the loans they make to the United States than American companies do when they invest in different, different parts of the world. So it's an incredibly favorable set of arrangements for the, for the United States. Also, if we look within the within the European Union, or more specifically within the Eurozones. There's the same division between creditor and debtor states. Germany is the great creditor state of the European Union. It's great exporter of goods, but also of capital. Where does that, Ger where does that German goods and capital go to? Crucially, they go to the weaker and smaller economies of the Eurozone. Um, the ones that are in the news at the minute because of, because of their inability to repay their debts, like Greece, like Portugal, like Spain, like Ireland, and, and, and so on. They are the debtor states of the European Union. But when you, when you look at it in those sorts of terms, you see that there's a relation of inter, interdependence. Although the German uh, political elite goes on about how you know, greedy and lazy Greeks are, and so on and so forth, in fact, German capitalism is dependent upon those other economies uh, to which they lend money in order to 
uh, provide markets for their goods. And this is a critical contradiction that I want to return to. Return to. The second form of imbalance in the financial system is the, what developed, um, uh, particularly from the early to mid-1990s onwards, which is an enormous proliferation of financial sp speculation, particularly centered on, the, um, on Wall Street in the United States and on, on the city, city of London. Um, these two great financial centers became massive centers for financial speculation and uh, in particular in the past decade, decade in the decade of the 2000s, they um, uh, became mass producers of different kinds of credit de derivatives that um, formed particularly effective ways of, of spec not just of speculating, but of passing on um, debt from one lender to another, so that um, the whole system of subprime mortgages and so, so on involved... Subprime mortgages were attractive to the banks because the worse a bet you are, the less good... Um, you the less good a risk you are, the higher the interest you have to pay. So if you had a subprime mortgage, you had to pay particularly high interest. But because of the risk involved in these subprime mortgages, the banks didn't want to hold on to them, so they would package them up into different forms of credit derivative, like the collateralized debt obligations that became particularly notorious. They would package them into uh, derivatives that they would then sell on to other, other investors who would then take, take the risk rather than the originating banks themselves. And it's emerged that the American banks were extremely effective at selling the riskiest mortgages on particularly to European and especially German, German banks. Um, and this helps to explain why a crisis in the American housing market that develops as subprime borrowers default on their mortgages spreads rapidly to affect the European banking system as, as well. Now, this uh, whole business of lending on a massive scale and then repackaging the debts in derivatives and passing them on from one bank or quasi-bank to, to another presupposed the availability of cheap credit. It presupposed borrowing being on a large scale very cheap. This was partly enabled by the very low interest rates that particularly the American Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, ran in the middle part of the last decade, but it also was made possible by um, the fact that there was this great flow of money from countries like China pouring into the, U the United States and then effectively seized on by the American banks and used to fund uh, the speculative activities that they were engaged in. So the imbalances were connected. Now, this then leads to the next point, which is much, most of the analyses of the crisis go on about this kind of stuff. The, the global financial imbalances, speculation, low interest rates, the deregulation of the financial system that took place from the 1970s and 1980s onwards, they go on about all that, and that's where they stop in an explanation of the crisis. We don't, because the, the crisis has to be seen against the background of a much longer term crisis of over-accumulation and profitability that develops in global capitalism in the course of the 1960s and which precipitates the global economy into a protracted period of crises of which this is simply the... The, the latest one, and the, the, the crisis of profitability has been very well analysed by a number of Marxist e economists. In our own tradition, Chris Harman and more recently Joseph Chunara, but a number of other Marxist economists, Bob Brenner and Andrew Kleeman in the United, S United States, have demonstrated the, ex the scale of the crisis of profitability that, that uh, developed. Now, what neoliberalism was really about was a concerted effort to overcome the um, crisis of profitability by forcing up the rate of unemployment, 
by weakening workers' organization, by deregulating labor markets and so on and so forth, forcing through her whole series of changes which would have the effect of increasing the rate of exploitation, in other words, increasing the level at which workers were exploited and thereby forcing up the, the, uh, the rate of profit. And it was successful to the extent that the rate of exploitation did increase. If you look, for example, at the United States, real wages have, have either stagnated or shrunk since the late 1970s, which is an incredible fact. The biggest and richest capitalist country in the world has operated on the basis of what's called wage repression for more than 30 years now. And what we've seen in recent years is wage repression um, uh, spreading, so that uh, in Germany, since the beginning of the, the millennium, we've seen labor costs um, held steady, sharp pressure on working class living, living standards, which is a very striking development, given that Germany is a society that's since the Second World War been seen as a high wage economy with strong trade unions and, 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 and so on. So they do increase the exploitation of workers. However, the rate of profit, um, if you're going to be technical about it, is the relationship between the mass of profits that are extracted from workers and the mass of capital that's invested. And the mass of capital doesn't just include wages, it includes all the other things that bosses invest in, machinery, buildings, etc., etc. Et and what you see is that even though there's a partial recovery in pro profitability, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, the period of neoliberal triumph, it doesn't restore the rate of profit to the levels of the post-world boom of the 1950s and 1960s. Now, why do I go into all this? I go into all this because I think we have to see the, the whole set of financial imbalances, and in particular the explosion of financial speculation that develops especially, although not exclusively, in the United States in the 1990s and in the 2000s as serving, as essentially having, this wasn't the plan, but this is how things worked out, as essentially providing an alternative way of driving economic growth in the absence of the rate of profit being restored to healthy levels. So if we look at the period before the present economic crisis, the, um, you have the speculative boom, which is characterized in particular by big increases in housing prices. Now, if you've taken out a mortgage to buy a house and its price rises, uh, psychologically, you probably feel richer because the value of your house has risen. More important economically, you can borrow more on the basis that the price of your house has, has, has risen. And through borrowing, well, if you borrow more, you can, you can spend more. And this happened on a very large scale in the United States and also happened here during the speculative boom that preceded the present crisis. This was a way of providing the effective demand, the demand for goods and services that was necessary to sustain economic growth. One Italian Marxist economist um, calls this, I'm going much too slowly, um, calls this uh, privatized Keynesianism. Maynard Keynes in the 1930s argued that the state had to step in and through its spending provide the effective demand that was necessary to sustain full employment when the private sector was too weak to do so. And what essentially we see is the financial system offering uh, in its own bizarre way an alternative way of sustaining effective demand. So that's well and good so long as the speculative boom is continuing. But speculative, cycles of speculation always end in a big bust. And that's what essentially happens in 2007 and 2008. It, the, the, um, we have um, the, the, that wave of speculation ending in the worst financial crash since, the, uh, since, the, since 19, 1929. But, the effect, but because of the role that financial speculation was play, had been playing in the previ previous decades, the financial crash 
in cracking up the financial system and stopping banks, for example, relying on credit derivatives in the way in which they hand. The number of collateralized, the value of collateralized debt obligations, for example, has absolutely collapsed since 2007, 2008. The, the collapse of the financial system destroys what had been the motor of the world economy. And that's why we find ourselves in such a serious eco economic slump. Now, that then leaves the world's ruling classes facing a very serious dilemma. Because on the one hand, um, the latest stage of the crisis is what they call the sovereign debt crisis. What do they, what do they mean by that? What do they mean by that? What, what, what the sovereign debt crisis is essentially the, the following. You have the outbreak of the crisis. You have the financial crash in autumn 2008, uh, followed by a global economic slump. In order to rescue the financial system, and in response to the economic crisis, governments increase spending on a very large scale. How do they find the money to increase spending? They find it by borrowing. The result is government debt increases, increases massive, massively. That then, um, what, you, what you then have is the, as a result of the rescues that take place, the bailouts, which are on a titanic scale, 40, according to the Bank of England, uh, between them, the US, Britain, and the Eurozone spend $14 trillion uh, on, on bailing out the financial system. So, uh, slightly over a year ago, thanks to these huge infusions of money, the financial markets revive. And the banks and quasi-banks and so on that operate in the financial markets are interested in making profits. They look around for a way of making profits. And they look at the huge increase in government debt and they say, hey, some states aren't going to be able to cope with this amount of debt. They're going to be forced into bankruptcy. So what we need to do is start speculating against those governments, selling their currency, um, selling the government bonds that these states issue as a way of borrowing m money. And of course it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is what happened to Greece in the early part of this year. Uh, okay, uh, in the early part of this year, the Greek government finds the price of its bonds falling massively on financial markets because of this kind of speculation. And when the prices fall, that means that the interest that they have to pay on their loans rises. They can't afford to make the interest repayments. They struggle to find people to buy the bonds when they have to sell them to debt and, and so on. So a very serious um, financial... Uh, so we have the crisis of, of, of sovereign, sovereign, sovereign debt. But this is a more superficial expression of something deeper. The deeper thing that it expresses is the following. I said that the underlying crisis is a crisis of overaccumulation and profitability. Putting it crudely, what that means is there's too much capital relative to the mass of profits that that capital is seeking to, to, to get, get hold of. Now, they've tried to restore profitability by squeezing workers and that way increasing the mass of profits, but it hasn't worked out too well. The other way of restoring profitability is to reduce the amount of capital, to destroy capital, what Marx calls the devaluation of capital, which is something that happens in economic crises. Firms go bust, their stuff is sold off cheap or simply scrapped. So a big chunk of the capital in the system can be destroyed in economic crises. But the effect of the bailouts is to ensure that much less capital is destroyed than otherwise would have been the case. And this isn't just true of the banks. One of the, the world's car industry suffers from massive overcapacity. Last year, the car, major car firms had the ability to produce something like 300, th sorry, 30 million more units, more cars and vans and so on, than they could actually sell. But no major car firm has gone bust as a result of the crisis. I mean, it's true that... <coughs> Chrysler and General Motors went formally into bankruptcy, but that was a form of state-organized rescue and restructuring of those firms, not their disappearance. So the pro under problem of the over-accumulation of capital hasn't gone away as a result of the, 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 the crisis. But then 
that then leads to the other horn of their dilemma, which is that confronted with this situation of higher government indebtedness and continuing over accumulation, you have the revival of the hard right, articulated, unfortunately, especially by our own delightful liberal conservative coalition. And this was the policy adopted at the G20, by the G20 in their summit a couple of weeks ago in Toronto, which is to say we can't afford this level of public debt, therefore we have savagely to cut public, public spending, uh, we have to push through austerity policies, the effect of this will be to liberate the private sector, which is laboring under the heavy burden of uh, a bloated public, public sector, and once the private sector is liberated, then economies can revive through exporting. And there are all sorts of nonsensical <coughs> historical parallels are used. I mean, for a while, the liberals and conservatives talked about the example offered by Canada in the 1990s when uh, the Canadian government slashed spending massively to reduce its deficit and that didn't lead to the end of the world economically. What they don't notice when they use this example was that this happened at a time when the American economy, Canada's huge neighbour in other words, was expanding considerably as a result of the first of the speculative booms that the United States experienced during that period. But now we're in a situation where with at present the exception of the United States all the major economies, and a lot of the little ones, are saying that they're going to pursue austerity policies. They're going to cut public spending and they're going to increase exports. Question, where are the markets going to come for these, these exports? And when you ask this question, there is no answer. And this is precisely what happened during the Great Depression of the 1930s. That governments adopted policies that squeezed their own markets in the hope that their neighbours wouldn't squeeze their markets and they'd be able to export by the, their neighbours. But if everyone squeezes their markets, no one, no one has a market to export to. So there's a real danger that the austerity policies will drive the world economy into a cycle of, cycle of decline. The US is resisting uh, the, these policies, but also um, uh, Obama has been... Uh, partially critical of the shift to austerity. But if you listen to what he's saying, he's also saying that the US can no longer be the consumer of last resort for the world, world economy. He said countries can't expect to solve their problems by exporting to the United States. He's playing fairly hardball with China which is enormously successful at exporting to the United States and so on and so forth. I'm going to shut up in a minute, Maxine, don't worry. Um, what this means is that, that the ruling classes globally are caught in the horns of a dilemma for which they have no solution. They have a hunch that the way out has to involve squeezing and battering their own working classes. But that's more a matter of instinct than any kind of coherent policy and strategy. If you like, it's the default position. We're in trouble, so we'll hit our workers as, as hard as as hard as possible. And what this then, of course, uh, does is to put the politics of resisting austerity as central to the agenda of the radical and the revolutionary left, not just in this country, but I think, I think globally. We can see this very clearly if we look at what's ha happening in other parts of Europe. But it also means talking about alternative policies. Talking about, because one of the striking things about the crisis is that neoliberalism is intellectually in fragments, but it still guides the policies of all the leading states and international institutions. One of, if resistance is to be politically credible, then it has to be related to policies that offer an alternative to neoliberalism and that point the way towards a different kind of economy. And if you look at what's happening at Greece at the minute, they're beginning to be debates about what those alternatives might be. So it's, this is a, both a really terrifying moment because what we're faced with a prospect is of an extension of the crisis on the backs of enormous suffering for working people and the poor, not just in Britain or Europe, but throughout the, throughout the world. But it's also a moment at which, if resistance develops, then we can see 
a struggle for real alternatives beginning to emerge. Thanks. Very kind. Um, uh, someone asked a question, um, how, how come it, I say that it's the worst economic slump since the Second World War? The, the answer is the following. Last year, world output fell for the first time since 1945. World output hasn't fallen since the end of the Second World War. The post-war boom starts really the late 1940s. In the, the end of the war, there's a period of economic disruption that sees world output shr shrunk. So this is the first time that it's happened since 1945. So I was just making a banal factual claim. Um, secondly, someone raised the question about whether there's a new housing bubble developing. I don't see that at all. I mean, there's some recovery in house prices in this country, but it's very weak and unstable. And in the US, house prices are still falling and dispossessions, people losing their ho homes, or what do they call it, jingle mail, um, in other words, where people just decide they can't afford to keep up the repayments on their house and they just, um, they just um, you know, abscond and, um, you know, push the keys through the letter letterbox. Those kind of things are continuing to, to, to happen. So in the United States, we're talking about the, the sector which was at the core of driving the boom, still very, very badly damaged. And that's true of other sectors of, sections of the financial system. One dimension of the recent crisis in the Eurozone is to do with the fact that, first of all, the markets ta targeted the states, but then they, the markets started to think, well, um, sorry, not, it's not really the markets. They're not persons. It's just lots of greasy, greedy bastards in different banks and other financial institutions, they started to think if these states are in trouble, then the banks who lent to those states are also in trouble. Where are the banks that lent to Greece and, and Portugal and Ireland and so on concentrated? Mainly in, in Germany and France, in, in the two biggest economies of the, the Eurozone. So there's been a real, as the European Central Bank itself said, real contagion. The in, or to put it a different way, I mean, this is a crisis that started in the banking system. The state came to the, to the rescue, but renewed attention, the, the, the concern about state borrowing renewed attention to the weaknesses of the bank, banking system, which are particularly severe in, in Europe. That leads me to, to Kostakis's, sorry, Christakis's questions. Um, first of all, uh, the U.S., is under pressure from the emergence of more powerful rivals. But it's still in an amazingly strong position. And that's reflected by the fact that, as, uh, as Chris Takis said, both uh, after the financial crash in the autumn of 2008 and again recently with the Eurozone crisis, the do dollar rose. In other words, the rich of the world see the, the dollar and more broadly the American economy as the safe haven um, if, the, if the system is in any, any kind of trouble. And there's no real rival to the dollar that's, that's emerged. I mean, the euro, there's now serious speculation about whether it can survive the, the decade, it's a, the, uh, which is something that would be astonishing to, 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 to imagine uh, even, even a year ago. Um, the Chinese currency, which one might say potentially could be a rival, um, is still a state-controlled currency. The Chinese banking system is st still heavily controlled by the state, which helped to protect China from the worst of the financial instability, but it, it makes it impossible for the Chinese currency, the renminbi, to act as a global reserve currency in the way in which the dollar is, uh, because being a global reserve currency means that investors all around can hold it, can use it in different transactions, and it's not really possible with the Chinese currency. Was there a concerted attack by the American banks on the, the euro? I mean, there may have been in the sense that they all decided we can make a bit of money by uh, sell it, selling the euro, but I don't think it reflects a deep-seated st strategic attack on the euro from the point of view of the American ruling class. In the longer, long term, the US has in general encouraged European economic integration because 
in, in the belief that that would make Europe a more stable and secure market for Ameri American capital. But in the short term, um, uh, if the euro falls, the dollar in all likelihood would, would rise. And the American ruling class aren't particularly happy about the dollar rising because they want to devalue their response to serious economic crises is always to try and find ways of devaluing the dollar against other currencies because that makes US exports cheaper and thus uh, you know leads to higher economic growth um, so I don't think there's a general American conspiracy against the the euro the final question that Chris Takis raised was about protectionism um, I don't see a big trend towards the the raising of um, tariff barriers bet between, between states as a result of the crisis. But there's certainly been a sig very significant increase in government subsidies to vulnerable bits of industry. The bailouts are a version of this, but we, the, the car industry in particular has received very substantial subsidies ar around, around the world. The other, the other element of what really is a form of protectionism is around the issue of currencies. Why is the conflict between the US and China so, in, so intense because the Chinese reacted to the development of the crisis by pegging their currency at a lower rate against the dollar than they had previously. As I said, their currency is controlled, which made Chinese exports cheaper. Uh, and that was precisely the time when the Americans wanted to devalue the dollar against everyone uh, in order to make their exports cheaper. Now, they found a temporary... Uh, compromise in which the Chinese have slightly increased the level at which their currency is pegged against the, the dollar. But I don't think it will resolve those tensions. And I think tensions um, over trade and currencies, particularly between the US and China, are likely to, to grow. I, I, I mean, one of the things that when I was writing my uh, Bonfire of Illusions, Chris Harmon and I disagreed about, because he read the manuscript, was that I argued that we were unlikely to see the kind of fragmentation of the world economy that took place in the 1930s. And my argument was because capital is much more integrated, capitalist production is much more integrated through the kind of gr global production networks that have now developed. So if those broke up through growth in protectionism, that would lead possibly to a worse depression than the 1930s. But Chris thought that... I was wrong about that and that actually there was a lot of economic integration before the 30s and it didn't stop the unravelling of the world economy. I suppose we'll see who, who's, who proves to be right about, about that. Just, just two points in, in conclusion. Uh, how serious is the danger of a double dip recession? I think it's quite serious. I think what we've seen is that the kind of rescue of the world economy that took place uh, in the winter... 2008-9, when the world economy, after the collapse of Lehman's, slipped into a severe slump. That is running out of steam. The austerity measures that have been adopted push in the, the, um, in the, in the, in the direction of driving the world economy down. Someone raised a question about China and the raw material deliveries to China. China, because of the scale of state intervention to lift the Chinese economy in response to the, the slump, China has been one of the key drivers of the, the recovery, and that's why raw material deliveries have, have increased. But the, the last month that there, was, that there were reports for it, Chinese manufacturing export actually fell. And throughout East Asia, which has been pulled up by the Chinese economy, there's also been a slowdown of growth. So there's a, there's a very serious danger of a double-dip recession. In other words, the austerity policies don't just cause suffering for working class people and the poor, they also uh, are making the economic situ situation worse. That's why it's important to talk about alternative policies. But I've gone on for too long. I'm sorry to talk seriously about what those alternatives would represent. But there's a very interesting discussion in Greece about uh, alternatives where people are saying, well, um, if the price of Greece staying in the euro is these austerity policies, should Greece leave the euro? And if Greece leaves the euro, what, so, what sort of economic policies should it be accompanied by? 
Kostas Lapavitas, a Greek Marxist economist, um, gave a meeting about the euro raising these kinds of, kinds of questions. And it's, it's a very interesting debate because traditionally much of the left in Europe, the harder left, were actually against not simply the euro but the European Union. That has kind of vanished in the last 20 years. But when the, as the European Union is in crisis and as the attempts to hold the EU together are very visibly at the expense of working class people internationally, then that poses the question of alternatives and of challenging the structures of the European Union in a way that, as I say, hasn't been on the agenda for some time. This is a very interesting situation. Obviously, there's a danger of just saying we should leave the euro, we should leave the EU of uh, making concessions to nationalism. But there is a, a, poss a possibility of talking about, as our comrades in Greece do, talking about an anti-capitalist break with the European Union. And the fact that these questions are back on the agenda is an illustration of the severity of the crisis and the importance, as Alan said, of building the resistance to the ruling class measures that are trying to displace the costs of the crisis onto us.